good morning or afternoon or evening whenever you're watching if you're watching in the replay welcome to the scripture habit <clears throat> welcome to this resource this community this i don't know whatever we could be our goal is to help you develop that habit of getting into scripture every day so we show up we say we'll discuss it together right this isn't this isn't preaching this is a, a bible study yeah my name is Rebecca, by the way. I am a pastor. I am a preacher. Uh, but I am in West Virginia. I get to be a host here at the Scripture Habit, and I say welcome. Uh, welcome. I'd love to know if you came by. <clears throat> I'm going to wait just a second for friends who join us in the live. Ooh, I need to share it on my page. I keep forgetting to do that. Try to remind myself. Ooh. Let me know. If you're visiting, um, if you're coming in for the replay, can you let me know that you came by? I only see such a small portion of our people, and I would love to know that you that you joined us. Yeah, <clears throat> here we go. We are live. Just watch me for like two seconds. There we go. All right. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm in a different. Uh, different spot. I'm actually in a, one of our Sunday school rooms, uh, our kids, one of our kids' rooms at the church. Uh, it's snowing. It was snowing again through the night. It's supposed to snow some more. And uh, so my husband is working remotely from where I usually broadcast. So we're here. This is good, right? I'm going to wait just a second. Let me know that you're here. I see people starting to come in. So hopefully we're good. Yeah, let me know that the signal is good. All right, we are going to pray and get started. Let's do it. Let's pray. Good morning, Lord. God, we love you. We appreciate you. That just seems to not even do it justice. Because we appreciate a lot of things. Lord, can't imagine going through life without you. I thank you for your nearness. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your unfailing love and compassion. Mm. Speak to us through your word, we ask in your name. Amen. Amen. Judy, good morning. Good morning. All right. <clears throat> okay. Let me go ahead and pull over the scripture that we have today. We are in John chapter 13 now. We're going to do the first part of it. Uh, roughly, it's this section, verse 1 through, I think, 18. It is um, when Jesus washes the disciples' feet, and then he has a conversation after about it. We're going to look at that together. It's probably um, a moment that you have heard of uh, if you have gone to church around Easter. Uh, usually, so... I didn't grow up in a church that did this, but um, the church that I that I came from before God sent us to West Virginia, um, Dayspring Church in Cincinnati, Dayspring Church of God, a really great church. If you're in Cincinnati, um, they're amazing people. I highly recommend it. But every um, Holy Week, they actually would, on Thursday, they'd call it the Monday Thursday service, and it included um, kind of a experiencing the Last Supper, which is what this moment is, and washing of feet. Can I tell you, I'm not a feet person. I don't know if anyone else is. Um, I oh, There's something about it. I was never really like, at, growing up, never really uh, keen on this idea. When I was a teenager, this idea that Jesus washed their feet, I was like, oh, man. Uh, but I have since come to really find such significance in this moment. Do I still think it's awkward walk, walk, walking, uh, washing people's feet? Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> I do. And I think it should be. There's a, this awareness of stuff that's in us that, that shows up. So anyway, let's go ahead and let's start going into the scripture. Because it's 18 verses, I'm not going to have us read all 18 and then go back. I'm actually going to have us talk about it as we go. All right. So here we go. The Gospel according to John here at the Scripture Habit. Okay. 
Starting in verse 1, before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. There's a reason why the writer reminds us that it's the Passover festival. Uh, and, and that's because and there's such a connection about who Jesus is that was being foretold through the Passover experience, right? And so just as every year God's people will um, honor this, this moment where God delivered his people, where God showed up in miraculous ways and did for them what they could not do for themselves, right? To bring them freedom from captivity, yeah? It's, it's a um, foreshadow of Jesus. Jesus is what we would call the Passover lamb, the sacrifice being made on behalf of the people, yeah? So it also says he knew that his hour had come. We're starting to see this. Good morning. I, I'm sorry. I see Judy, Darlene. I think I said hi to Judy already. Bonnie, Suzanne. Good morning, guys. Jesus had mentioned before, or the writer had mentioned that Jesus had been very aware now in this last season, as it were, that this is, this is the hour where his time had come. And we're now in, like, this Passover experience that's starting. It's right before, um, well, it'd be, you know, the Thursday before the Saturday, right? So he's aware of what's coming, acutely aware. And I pray that as we read these last moments that we, that we recognize that, that Jesus, fully God, but also fully man, right? And that means for him being fully man, as beautiful as it is, he has emotion, right? He, um, some, some people might not want to think this because they think it would, you know, taint the image of the uh, deity of Jesus, but Jesus is fully God, but also as fully man, it means he could experience moments of, of fear or anxiety because your body is responding to this reality of a moment. Jesus could experience all of that, right? And I find comfort in that because it lets us know Jesus truly can relate to, to our life experiences, feelings of rejection, um, mourning for losses, all of this, yeah? I'm, I realize I'm saying yeah a lot this morning. I'm sorry, y'all. Yeah. Hi, Joanna. Okay, so then the author writes this statement. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. That phrase to me is this almost summary statement that signifies the rest of what comes, right? Um, having loved his own who are in the world, well, we can think that that is referring to his followers. Um, could it also be all people? All people that, that he felt were God's creation, right? They, they, they were in essence his. Could be, could be either, right? But it says he loved them to the end. Verse two. Now when it was time for supper, the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas, Simon Iscariot's son, to betray him. This thing, the devil had already put it in the heart of Judas. Um, I've heard questions come up from friends, you know, as, as we're discussing, and they're like, you know, this idea of Judas being a pawn for the devil in this moment. Was it, was it foredestined? People would be like, you know, did, did God place Judas Iscari Iscariot there? And, um, you know, he, he purposed for Judas to do, to do this betrayal. It, it does give us questions, right? We, what is this? What is this? Uh, I really like, I think it's the JFB. No, this is Faith Life Study Bible. The quote here uh, from John Barry, 
God allows evil to play its role so that his greater purposes can be accomplished. I do not believe that, um, I don't believe that God looks at human, at, at each individual person and says, I'll save you and I'll save you, but I'm not going to save you. Uh, I don't believe that. I don't believe that that's consistent with the heart of God, that he would choose some and not want to save all. So, so even as I read this, I know God's heart for Judas, just like his heart for every one of us, even when we betray him, uh, is, is still love. Oh, that he wished that we would turn from our selfish stupidity and arrogance, you know, um, being greatly deceived. God wishes all of us would turn. And, and I feel that for Judas as well. I think the writer is just pointing here, reminding us that in this moment, what John doesn't include in this gospel, which others do include, is kind of that moment when, when um, like the light bulb switches for Judas. A lot of people actually think that it points back to when Judas complained about the perfume that could have been sold and money could have been given and that he got kind of, that was the final straw that made Judas want to betray. Nah, I don't know. I don't know. That's an interesting thought, right? Again, the writer is letting us acknowledge that there was already this sense, this turn in Judas's heart. And I want to remind you, he pointed out that it was supper. He doesn't talk about communion in this account of the Last Supper, um, perhaps because he knows that other accounts in include that already. Let's continue on. What are you thinking, by the way? Put it in the comments. Let me know. Uh, it is a snowy day. Hi, Susan and Stephanie. Good morning, guys. Verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had given everything into his hands, that he'd come from God and that he was going back to God. I bolded that and then I do what I sometimes do, what I encourage you to do if you're looking at scripture sometimes and you kind of sense there's a lot in this to unpack, right? So break it out a little, right? It's the exact same words in the verse, but I just kind of took it. It's like he's listing things off. So these are the things that Jesus knew. One, that the Father had given everything into his hands. Two, that he'd come from God. And three, that he was going back to God. And when I started to break those out, I'm like, okay, what, is, what do those represent? I'm just curious. What, what is this? If Jesus knows, if you know that you know that you know something, there's a, there is a measure of comfort and confidence, right? Doesn't mean that things that you walk through won't be difficult. And we know that with Jesus. But John is making sure to mention that Jesus has this this comfort and confidence and awareness of these three things that end up being this motivator for him to continue forward, right? So what are these three things I point out? That number one, that the Father's given everything into his hands. This awareness of sovereignty, of authority, right? Um, both for God and for Jesus, who is, is this God-embodied representative of humanity, right? Number two, when he says that he'd come from God, Jesus has this confident awareness. He knows who he is, right? He knows exactly who he is. He knows his identity and his purpose. Why is he there? The whole reason he'd come, right? You would imagine, man, if you're walking through anything difficult, and we don't walk through anything to the measure of Jesus, um, if we remember who we are, our purpose, our identity, it makes a difference. We can walk through difficult things, right? And number three, that he was going back to God, the end result, right? The end result. So Jesus knew these three things, um, which all tie to God's purpose and plan being accomplished in this moment, even this really ugly, difficult moment, right? Oh, Susan, Susan says, I always wondered that about Jesus. Judas. It worried me that he had no choice and that he's condemned. Uh, yeah, no, I, I believe Judas does represent us, 
right? Uh, I, I think there are moments where we see God's sovereignty in Scripture where, where God says, you know, God let them have their way. God, God left them to basically their devices. He allowed them to do that which their selfishness and sin wanted them to do, right? I think that's the case for Judas, but um, I do not believe for a second that he was a pawn by God and lost his opportunity to be with God. I don't believe that for a second. That's God, God doesn't play games. God doesn't waste people. You know, I mean, it's just not consistent with him. So looking at the nature of God, as we're, as we're seeing that, we can still sense God's heart and, and hope even when someone chooses to turn away. At least that's how I do it, yeah. Ooh, I love this. Suzanne. Suzanne says her NIV study Bible, I wonder which one it is, by the way, notes that John emphasizes the fulfillment of God's plan and Jesus' control of the situation. Yes, yes. Sovereignty, purpose, and identity, and the end result, right? Yeah, I love that. Okay, verse 4. So he got up from supper, laid aside his outer clothing, took a towel, and tied it around himself. I marked these. The outer clothing would be, um, it, it's a visible representation of who you are. And a lot of times it, it represents class. It represents social status, your clothing, your, your, for them, that like this outer layer. It would tell everyone around you kind of how much money you have, if you have a certain job, whatever. And, and remember, Jesus is identified by this point. He is, he is God incarnate, right? The people around him are aware of this. He is the king, that the Messiah that God has sent to usher in God's new kingdom, right? Wouldn't you imagine that a king would be dressed as such? right? That he would begin to wear things that, that let everyone around know who he is. And I think even of, of priests in that moment, right? Any, any of the priests or any of the Sanhedrin, that high echelon, the social elite governing community of the Jews, uh, when they walked around in town, everyone knew who they were because, because their outer clothing identified it. Here we see Jesus makes a point to take that off to take that off. And then what he puts on himself, and, and this is symbolism, guys. He takes the towel, and that's what he puts on himself. And then what does he do? Verse 5, next he poured water into a basin. He began to wash his disciples' feet and to dry them with the towel that is tied around him. We've talked before, I'm actually not going to take a lot of time to talk about how washing feet was like the lowest of the low job, right? What I will point out is this moment, again, everyone around Jesus is probably wondering, is this the moment when the king takes over the kingdom, right? Where, where political power is shifted. Is this the moment this, this Passover, this, this is a big deal, right? And, and so picture, listen, picture his disciples who have faithfully sacrificed and served alongside him for the last three plus years, right? Um, picture what we know has happened, which is disciples at, at different moments have had this question that they've wanted like, affirmation from Jesus. Am I going to be one of those leaders and powerful people in your kingdom? We've seen, we've seen the disciples ask this question. The, they've had this discussion, who's the greatest? At, and in some senses, even at that table, who's going to sit the closest to Jesus? Because the ones that sit right next to him are supposed to be like his right-hand people, right? And so all of this continues to come up. And Jesus over and over corrects. Over and over, he says, you know, the last shall be first, the first shall be last, right? 
and and he has given over and over correction. I think of this moment, which I don't, it wasn't captured in the Gospel of John, but it's in another Gospel, I think Luke, where uh, James and John's mom, her name is Salome, she goes up to Jesus and she basically says, please tell me that my sons can be your, your right-hand people. Tell me that my sons will have this elevated prestige position. She, she wants to advocate for her sons. Maybe her sons don't have the nerve to ask Jesus. So she's going to do it, right? It is, it is human. It is human that we often are assessing the world around us to figure out where we stand. Wouldn't you agree? You go to your job. What influence do I have? What authority or responsibility do I have? Do I have people reporting to me? Should they be listening to what I have to say? Right? Um, how much money do I have? That, that should define somehow as if, as if I'm wiser and people should listen to me because I have the opportunity to have greater influence. That's humanity. And Jesus has had to correct that posture, that fleshly tendency, which is driven by ego and what places a greater value on you and your own interests than in following Jesus. And so I think in that moment, we're here at what should be. Jesus keeps saying the hour has come, right? And he predicts his own death. And yet here are his disciples around him and they continue to argue over who's the greatest. They continue to um, be kind of jealous of one another. And Jesus sees it even in this moment, guys, even at the Last Supper. And so when, when he does this, this is another moment where he's saying, I have to correct something that you aren't getting yet, but it's so prevalent. If you are not careful, you are going to take the wrong posture. And that is this, when, when everyone else is thinking about how am I going to be seen and respected by others? Jesus is willing to take the lowest of the low to strip off those clothing that should represent the respect and honor that he rightly deserves. And instead, he ties around himself the towel, the object that becomes a tool for cleansing for the lowest of the low in that house. He washed their feet. And as I said in the beginning, uh, there, I don't think there'll ever be a moment where I read that and, and the inside part of me goes, Ugh, you know, Ugh, especially thinking about feet back then and uh, all of it. Can you imagine how the disciples looked in this moment, looking at this, knowing who he is and being like, wait a minute, whoa, what are you doing, right? This isn't your job. That's not your job. Why are you doing that, Jesus? You shouldn't do that. That's not fitting for you. You're the king. He came to Simon Peter who asked him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered him and said, what I'm doing you don't realize now, but afterward you will understand. You will never wash my feet, Peter said. And Jesus responded, if I, if I don't wash you, you have no part with me. Again, this hits on this awareness of Peter. Peter thinks Jesus, like it's, it's not appropriate, right? Because of who Jesus is. This isn't right that you wash my feet, Jesus. The JFB made this observation that I loved. They said, what Peter could not submit to was that the master should serve his servant. If Peter then could not submit to let his master go down so low as to wash his feet, how should he suffer himself to be served by him at all? When we are thinking so much about defending ourselves and validating ourselves, and it's elevating ourselves, right? As if we don't realize that the shift, the, the fight that's still happening in our flesh. And I love that they wrote out, like, listen, Peter was still wrestling because he was still not realizing what the master was even going to be doing. 
and and to to wash his feet what about to die for your sins right how are you going to accept that jesus does that and you won't accept that he'd wash your feet yeah isn't that profound that got me might not get you but i was like oh that's good let's keep going Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not only my feet, but also wash my hands and my head. As if it's this like over the top. Well then, yes, I'm going to agree to whatever you're saying you need to do. I'm going to be with you. I'm like the loyal, dedicated one. Wash all of me. Jesus' response in 10 is really interesting. Uh, One who has bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he is completely clean. There's a lot of theology in that. And, and I went ahead and, and pointed it out real fast. Uh, this thing that he's saying, this idea, someone gets bathed and then they don't have to get fully bathed every time, but they wash the feet. In the culture there, um, they would be bathed. Cleanliness was important. But the washing of the feet would happen every time they enter someone's house. Why? Because every time they go walking around out there, their feet get nasty, right? And it's... Um, respect for the the house person that you're not going to bring all the nasty into their house, right? Jesus, again, is using symbolism. The first bathing for you and I, this first spiritual bathing, is what we would call justification. Jesus justified us and we receive his justification when we confess our sins and confess our need for him and confess our belief in submission in him as our savior and as our Lord, our king. Yeah, that's justification. Uh, Regeneration is this awareness that you and I, Jesus has justified us, right? But we want to live a life that sins less, that follows Jesus more, right? But we're not perfect at it. We don't become perfect Uh, never sin again Christians just because we pray the prayer. So regeneration is this act of us having to continually submit ourselves to the master to have our feet washed. Yeah. To me, it's totally different when I'm not just thinking of the posture of the servant, when I'm thinking of the posture of the recipient, you have to submit yourself. You have to know that your feet are dirty and you're going to have to sit there and let someone else wash your feet when they see all the ugly, when they see maybe the things that you would like to hide. Um, Maybe they see some of the literal poop that you've gotten yourself into. Yeah. Feels different, right? Mm. Jesus says, so the one who's bathed, Jesus told him, doesn't need to wash anything except his feet, but he's completely clean. You are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him. The writer includes that, right? The writer says, uh, well, he knows in the room, Judas has not submitted to the master, right? He knows that. And so the writer acknowledges that Jesus knows that. Remember, Jesus knows that. And, and also, I love, there's not this assumption that everybody who followed Jesus in that room was clean. Because the symbolism is submitting to the master. And then Jesus does take it further. Um, he asked, do you know what I've done for you? Isn't that the awareness, right? You have to understand, if you're, if you're not going to let him wash your feet now, what are you going to do when he stands up to lay down his life for your sin? He says, now he takes it a step further. He says, so I, if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I've given you an example that you should do just as I have done for you. A lot of times we read that and and we think about taking on the posture of humility. Yes, yes. But I also think that's a posture of genuine discipleship and accountability, right? Right? Because when we're doing that washing of feet, that regeneration, that over and over submitting to Jesus, acknowledging our need, um, 
there's this relationship. And, and so you and I can walk that out with brothers and sisters who help hold us accountable and remind us of our need. We need to not forget it, right? We need to not to think uh, that we're really great and, and start to fuel our ego again and forget the complete difference in posture that Jesus wants us to carry. Yeah. To me, that is a beautiful and deep, profound message that comes from this moment of Jesus washing people's feet, his disciples' feet. And I pray it'll, it'll resonate in your mind today as you go. What would you do if Jesus tried to wash your feet? And what does that say about you? Right? What does that say about the stuff that might be going on in your heart? And, and then let's pray. Lord, help us truly submit to the master and receive what you're willing to do for us that is so personal. Yeah, Lord, help us. We ask that right now. Thank you, Lord, that you are willing to see every ugly detail of us and love us and cleanse us. Help us remember to continue to come to you, acknowledging that our feet are dirty and being willing to ask you to wash our feet. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 I hope you love today. I love scripture, man. Ah, it should make you excited. It should stir some things in your heart. It should challenge. It should point out the, the ugly. It should hurt a little. The ouch, right? Yeah. Do me a favor. Hit the share button. Can you do that? Can you invite someone into this journey of scripture? Um, invite someone to develop that habit with you. It is, it is sometimes a tough habit. You know, we get it. And none of us in this, in this room are perfect at it. But that heart and that posture is life-changing. And when we open up God's word and really allow God to speak on us, shine his light on us through his word, that is profound. That's life-changing. Offer that to a friend. Yeah. Have a great day, guys. I'll see you Monday. <laughs>